It all began when Zindros discovered the fabled spellbook of the necromancer Venus in her long lost tomb in the barren hills. The book was of course cursed, but Zindros removed these with relative ease, for he was a powerful wizard, one adept at removing the curses even of one as mighty as the Witch Queen Venus. But as he began translating and transcribing these ancient texts in the long extinct language of the Asmerians, Zindros began to feel a strange unease. He began to see things just out of the corner of his eye and hear strange rustling among the scrolls and parchment that lined his study. Zindros never found anything amiss, but he began to lock the doors and shutters of his study whenever he pursued Venus's tome. Then came the nightmares, unremembered in the light of day, save wakening in a cold sweat and claw marks on his face where he had slashed himself. Soon Zindros's retainers noticed changes in their master. He spent more and more time alone in his studies, neglecting the affairs of his great keep. Zindros then began to refuse all visitors and banished his retainers one by one until he was left only with Balthor, his oldest and most loyal servant. Now Zindros never left his chambers, sometimes leaving the food that Balthor left for him for days at a time untouched. One day, when Balthor crept to the door to retrieve the uneaten food, he heard behind the heavy oaken door strange sounds, growls, screams, utterances in a language he had never heard. When the sounds reached a horrifying crescendo, the door burst asunder sending Balthor against the wall and crushing him. Yet even in death, Balthor remained a servant to his master. Walking behind Zindros with slow halting steps, staring out with undead eyes. For now Balthor had been reanimated by the necromatic spells that had consumed Zindros' mind and made him one of the ultimate examples of the D&D cliched Mad NPC. Hello again, I'm KR King. This is my YouTube channel dedicated to helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. So this is part of my ongoing series on D&D cliches and how you can utilize them to your advantage. Now there's a whole host of, you know, subsets of the insane NPC trope you know, in classical D&D &D play. And each has its own characteristics and correspondence to historical and literary examples. You know, these include the insane ghost, uh, the insane god, uh, the insane betrothed, and the insane monster. And of course, there are subsets within each of these tropes. So for example, the insane monster uh, makes a difference if you have, say, an insane dragon as opposed to an insane kobold. One is going to be a lot more threatening to the players than the other. And I'm hoping to go over each of these examples in a future video or videos probably because they're really fun to do. But what I wanted to do today was concentrate on what might be the classic uh, mad NPC trope in D&D, &D, which I'm going to call the Mad Professor. And as I do that, I'm going to stress that the key for you as a GM uh, to play this trope effectively is one, to understand the source of the insanity, then two, to be creative in its effects, both in terms of the NPC's environment, but also on the players when they encounter them. And you wanna have an idea of how this insanity can be alleviated or even cured by the player characters. So just as with your storylines and scenarios in general, the more you know about your insane NPC, the more real and compelling they will appear to your players and the more interesting the encounter. All right, so let's talk about this classic cliched, you know, insane figure from history and literature, the mad professor. You know, and it has a long tradition historically as the thinker who delved too deep in abstract thought and lost contact with reality. You know, you have figures like the philosopher uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the mathematician John Nash. Uh, you have chess champions such as Paul Morphy uh, or Bobby Fischer. Uh, again, these figures may not have been clinically diagnosed as being crazy, but they certainly showed some classic crazy smart person behavior. 
you know, and in literature, of course, you have Dr. Moriarty of the Sherlock Holmes uh, novels. You have the mathematician in Lovecraft's classic story, uh, Dreams in the Witch House. You know, and it all points to the notion that very intense mental effort carries with it a risk of scrambling the brain. And oftentimes with a literary example, you have a very smart person who goes insane and becomes a super villain. You know, Moriarty is the only human being who can match wits with Sherlock Holmes. And you have in all the Bond books and films, you've got the super villain who is also super intelligent. You know, and Lovecraft has Al Harzed, who wrote the Necronomicon, uh, very intelligent and totally insane. So, of course, when you extend the Mad Professor trope to D&D, it lends itself most obviously to the wizard class because this is based on intelligence. But in fact, you can use a mad person in any of the character classes, any humanoid, any monster, really. Anytime you have a highly intelligent character who goes insane and potentially is a very powerful character before they go insane or powerful monster, you have a tremendous opponent for the players. So our first criteria then for the mad professor trope when we apply it to D&D is whatever the creature, uh, whether humanoid or monster, it should be highly intelligent. Which means that they are going to be very creative in terms of rationalizing their behavior. They do not think that they are insane. And they're going to present this to the players so that you get very varied and sophisticated situations and environments with the players when they're confronting the mad professor, the super intelligent crazed NPC. So the three main aspects that you always want to think about of the mad professor trope NPC is the origin of the insanity. How did they go insane? You know, the effects of that insanity in terms of the actions of the NPC and in the interactions with the player characters. And finally, what is the cure for this insanity? And if you as the GM have a pretty concrete idea of all three of these, uh, first of all, this mad NPC can become a great, you know, super villain uh, to oppose the players and then potentially a tremendous ally if the players cure them of the insanity. You know, depending, of course, on what they were before they went insane. A mad lich and a sane lich are probably going to be enemies of the players. Now, you can also argue that a lich sort of by definition is insane, but that's another bad. So in my intro example, I used the evil tone cliche as the source for Zindros the Wizard's Insanity. You know, and this has a long literary tradition. I mentioned the Necronomicon of Lovecraft's uh, mythos. Uh, there's also uh, the, the true writings of Nostradamus. You know, there's the real-life Voinovich manuscript, which to this day has never been translated. So the conceit here is that there are ideas or truths which are so foreign or terrible that they would drive any human being insane. And this is easily transferable to a D&D setting, you know, in which you have, say, infernal magic, which not only is it the words, uh, but the power behind them uh, that overwhelms the mind of a reader. So you can also have an artifact that knowingly, if it's sentient, or merely as an effect of its power, will drive anyone who tries to wield it insane. Think of Morbius in the film The Forbidden Planet, who utilizes, you know, the brain amplifying devices of the crowd. But notice here that when you have the mad professor, because of their high intelligence, they're usually able at some level to resist this power. Oftentimes this is sort of what makes them insane. They don't merely allow their mind to be wiped clean like an ordinary mortal would. You know, they retain part of their personality. You know, and in this way, they're, they're almost like a free agent, as it were, and this provides the key for the players to get in there and possibly free them from this effect. Now, you can also have the traditional curse as a source uh, for the insanity, uh, whether some powerful creature that just does this out of spite or something that, you know, uh, the NPC did and then was cursed for that. You can also have a literary form of this where the, uh, the NPC did some horrible deed and was cursed for this. So obviously if you get a powerful enough remove curse just as a spell, perhaps you can remove this. But oftentimes there is a wrong that has to be righted by the player characters, something acknowledged by the cursed NPC, this sort of thing, in order to fully uh, affect the remove curse. And in all of these, the origin story affects both obviously how the insanity came about, but also how the behavior of the NPC in terms of their obsessions, uh, what they think about, what they believe to be the truth about what happened to them. All right, so next what you want to think about are the effects of this madness on your NPC. 
you know, and for the mad professor type especially, but really any kind of, you know, insane NPC in a D&D setting, I tend to avoid the hysterical, blathering, you know, stereotypical insane person cliche. You know, if they're going to go totally nuts, save it for some climax of their interactions with the NPCs. Because unless they're actually there when the NPC goes insane, they've had some time to sort of adapt themselves to this mental condition. And what people are constantly doing is trying to cope with what's going on in their environment and whatnot. And these mad NPCs have had a lot of time to do that. So I think it's always better to initially play the mad professor NPC who's highly intelligent, highly adaptive, as potentially very calm and very focused when they first meet the players. You know, so for example, if the player characters just stumble upon the mad NPC, you know, who's living in this lonely tower on the end of this peninsula? The, the NPC might be very welcoming, even hospitable, uh, before the effects of its insanity start to be obvious to the players. You know, what's interesting here is to consider how this insane NPC deals with and reacts to the world vis-a-vis -vis their condition. So the classic way of dealing with the world for a highly intelligent, you know, insane NPC is megalomania. The belief that their ideas and <laughs> attributes are not only superior to everyone else in the world, but that they in fact should rule the world. Or at least that it should operate under their set of ideas. Now what's interesting about this is this can lead to overconfidence. Think about the classic Bond villain who tells Bond, you know, all of their plans, and then instead of just, you know, shooting him, comes up with some elaborate method of killing him, a shark tank or some maze or something, uh, that of course ends up Bond being able to escape. Why? Because the megalomaniac is overconfident. They believe that they're smarter than everyone and act that way, when in fact they're not. You know, and the megalomania is a classic thing for, you know, non-crazy creatures that are highly or super intelligent, you know, beholders or dragons or whatever. And it works the same with crazed NPCs that are highly intelligent. It gives the players an opportunity, a sort of backdoor in there to outwit the super genius. You know, in another classic mad professor or mad highly intelligent NPC behavior is a persecution complex, which is really just a high order intelligence form of paranoia. So the world is out to get these people because they're jealous of their brilliant ideas. They're out to steal their items or their discoveries. Uh, they become very isolated because they can't trust anyone. You know, you have King Lear as the classic literary example of this. Uh, you have Howard Hughes as kind of a historical figure who exhibited this sort of madness. So when the players encounter this sort of NPC, if they don't directly threaten them, uh, the NPC might not at, at first react negatively, but once they do, once they think that these characters work into their paranoid persecution fantasy, they're going to react very vehemently. You know, you can also play with things like phobias and whatnot, fear of certain colors or items or whatever. You know, you can be creative here. Uh, the player, one of the player characters reminds them of someone or they imagine that there's someone. You can also have the classical effects, which are auditory and visual hallucinations. You know, and this can lead to some interesting ideas if the players know about the mad NPC before they go visit. They may try to impersonate someone from the, you know, NPC's past. They may try to convince them that some state of affairs uh, is the case uh, that fits in with the NPC's sense of an altered reality. And what you want to do is, you know, create a sort of randomized set of reactions for the mad NPC. You know, sometimes I'll write these out in a chart. I'll go from very favorable to very unfavorable. I'll also put some wild cards in there. You know, think of sort of the wild magic charts, this sort of thing. Again, most of the time I don't use charts for things. But with the mad NPC, what you're doing is you're almost taking it away from yourself as a GM. You're adding that insanity into the play. When you don't know what they're going to do and you just have to react as a GM, it really creates a sense of madness. All right, so this all ties into the last aspect of creating and running a mad NPC. Uh, and in this case, the mad professor is how can they be cured? Because I think if it's a fantastical madness with a fantastical source, you should be able to have a fantastical cure. Let's face it, you're not going to send Zindros, the mad wizard, to therapy. So if you want to make it simple, if for my introduction example, you destroy the evil book, the effect is gone, Zindros is cured. 
But even on such a simple timeline, that can be very complicated. First of all, Zindros may resist your efforts to get the book and destroy it. The book itself might resist it if it has some sentience. Plus, let's not forget about Venus, the Witch Queen. You know, does she have some effect? Where is she? Is she, if it was her tomb, does she have a spirit or something? Is she in the book? Where is Asmir and what was it all about? Now, you don't have to know all of these examples in depth, but it really helps to have an idea of this storyline so that when the players start to interact, whether it's with the book or Venus or uh, with Zindros or, you know, any, any aspect of this, you have a sense of how they would react to what the players are doing based upon you've got some knowledge about this. Because the thing is, someone or something may have driven the NPC insane for a reason. And when you know that, that'll impact how you work out the method by which the players cure it. So if we have a literary source for the crazed NPC, some crime was committed or horrible deed, obviously the players, perhaps with the NPC's help or opposition, have to right this wrong. You know, maybe it was just Zindros's, you know, arrogance and greed for knowledge that made him susceptible to the necromatic magic of Venus's book. Maybe he has to acknowledge that he has limits, that he made a mistake in pursuing this. So the players battle the book or the power of Venus or whatever. Zindros realizes his mistake and aids them in destroying it. He's cured and he rewards the players handsomely. You know, or the players have to find out where the, you know, ancient city of Asmir is. They have to find some artifact, perhaps the spell focus that Venaz used to create the book. They either destroy that or bring it back and wield it and end up freeing Zindros. The point is you can get more or less complicated on the means of curing the insanity, especially when you know the background of the insanity. And once you've done this and you've created this adventure out of this cliched mad NPCs, it's different uh, it's more interesting, and it's real to the players. All right, so there's my take on the mad professor of D&D. If you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more. Please leave some comments. I always answer them. And, of course, please keep playing D&D and tell somebody else about it.